A few weeks ago, I made a video playing an old version of KSP, exploring how janky the old space shuttle parts used to be, and I- It's too bad he couldn't go call further back when I started That's not old at all. He called us version old. He started playing his new oh, parts are so good. Hey, 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 Alright then, fine. Let's go back to the very first available version of Kerbal Space Program, shall we? Version 0.7.3. Is this what you guys wanted? Oh wow, yes, look how, look how, look how it sucks, look at the VAB. We've got like, no part, these are all of the parts that we have. We have this rubbish screw capsule, we have this decoupler, we have like one fuel tank, which I can't even place because it's, it's so janky, and then, and then like that's, that's the rocket that we've built, and then we launch, oh yes, there's a launch tower with a tutorial, let's skip that, and then, oh, we'll launch. And there's no SAS, and it's really difficult to control, and there's no way you can even go, there's no map screen, our Kerbals can't go on EVA, there's no MUN, there's nothing to visit. IS THIS THE CONTENT THAT YOU WANTED?! Okay, but, like, for real, there's really not a lot of things to compel one to play the actually ancient versions of Kerbal Space Program. Like, that wasn't a bit. There was no map screen, no planets or moons, apart from Kerbin, no SAS even, and your Kerbals can't EVA either, so you can't even have your space frogs do anything. And water wasn't real. That was weird. But maybe there is a challenge to be had in one very particular old version of KSP. Version 0.16. This released on the 20th of July in 2012, when I were a mere 17 years old. And this was my setup at the time, so ask me again why I wasn't playing Steam games. But this update was a big one, as it meant that Kerbals could now go on EVA, we had 2.5 meter parts, and we had a map screen. But no maneuver nodes yet. Bad times. So at this point in the game, it was still fairly challenging to do a MUN mission, since we don't have a maneuver planner. But it's still compelling enough a version for a video since Kerbals could EVA, and really, what's the point of going anywhere if you can't get your space frogs out on a little moonwalk? So we're going to land on the moon without the ability to make maneuver nodes, walk Jebediah coming around, and overall just have a fun old time in what was Kerbal Space Program's sleekest update at the time. Though it's not quite as sleek as these hover pens by Novium, who have sponsored today's video. Have you ever seen a pen that floats before? I'm a huge nerd for these sorts of things, and I'm completely in love with mine. The hover pen by Novium isn't just a writing tool. It received the award of one of the best inventions of 2022 by time for good reason. Hovering at a precise 23.5 degree angle, this pen is a tribute to Earth's axial tilt and is an instant conversation starter. It's not just for show, though. The hover pen offers a smooth writing experience and comes in stunning colours like Mars Magma and Starlight Silver. It's refillable too, so you can use it forever. <laughs> and if you want something really out of this world, you can buy the premium meteorite edition, which features an actual piece from a meteorite older than the Earth itself. How cool is that? The hover pen future edition features an interchangeable tip, so you can use it with either a rollable tip or, and this is definitely my preference, a fountain pen one. Whether for yourself or as a timeless gift, the hover pen combines art, space and functionality in one amazing package. Use my code MATLOWN to get 20% off and free shipping to most countries only for 48 hours. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much to Novium for sponsoring today's video. So here we are at the Kerbal Space Center. As you can see, it looks a little bit different to what you might be used to. We have the old buildings. We have this new building here, though. This is the tracking station. This was only recently added. Um, this is the uh, this is the solar system. We have uh, a lens flare that represents the sun. It doesn't look like there's an actual physical object there. And uh, we have Kerbin, the Mun, and out here we have Minmus, and that's it, that's the whole system. So that's the tracking station. Uh, we'll get to the VOB in a second. We also have the space plane hangar. Let's have a quick look at this. So with this version of the game, you have to pick your command pod before you start building. Let's go with the prettiest part ever to have existed in Kerbal Space Program. And yeah, this is the space plane hangar. So obviously a bit jankier than the modern one we have today, but there is something quite, I quite like about it, like the animated things in the background and all these moving parts. I kind of like it. It's kind of kind of cool, kind of janky. Reminds me of like the old Lego games for some reason. And then of course, we have the vehicle assembly building as well. So we can pick a command pod and uh, I guess just start the construction of a rocket. Yeah, what a novel idea. Let's build a rocket. Not done one of them in a while. <laughs> I say that. But my last couple of videos were space shuttles, weren't they? So, pfft. yeah, who knows. <laughs> So as you watch the construction, you can see this version of the game is kind of the same, but kind of different. So the little 
tab groupings at the top, well, well, they're on the top, not the side. They're all slightly different, so things like, you know, decouplers and intakes are all just part of the structural tab. Fuel tanks and engines are grouped into just one tab because there's barely any engines and fuel tanks. And speaking of the engines and fuel tanks, they look kind of jank, don't they? I feel like the word jank is going to come up time and time again in this video. But I mean, how else would you describe the original look of the FLT400 fuel tanks there? You know, the little side tanks I've got there? Oof. And even the uh, Reliant engines. I don't think they're called the Reliant yet, but these engines on those side boosters are the predecessors for the Reliant engine in modern KSP. Oof, and there's no shroud around the Poodle engine, but the landing gear is unchanged, as is the parachute and the uh, Apollo-style command pod at the top. So, you know, like I say, kind of the same, kind of different. And here we are doing my patented little shot of zooming in to check out the stack on the launch pad ahead of the launch. And of course, the launch pad is uh, joined by this tower, which always spawns there. So you actually have to be careful about how big you built your rocket, because there was a chance it could just clip into the launch tower and thus not work. But yeah, that's the, uh, the launch pad there. And here we are flying through the atmosphere. Now this rocket uses an asparagus staging setup. So if those who don't know, asparagus staging is a rocket design technique where the outer boosters feed fuel to the inner boosters, keeping the central tanks full until the outer tanks are empty, if that makes sense. So once an outer tank is drained, it is jettisoned, reducing the rocket's weight and improving efficiency. Basically, this method maximizes fuel usage and keeps weights to a minimum. So it's very, very efficient. It's not as popular in modern Kerbal Space Program as it was back in OG Kerbal Space Program because one of the trade-offs is obviously you have lots of boosters which uh, increases aerodynamic drag. Aerodynamics weren't as much of an issue in OG KSP. Uh, an exception in modern KSP being things like EVE landers or of course landers that you know, take off from bodies that don't have an atmosphere, for example Tylo. Now, speaking of atmosphere, you might be curious about our uh, weird ascent profile where I'm just going straight up. And that's because in old Kerbal Space Program, the optimal ascent profile was to go straight up until you reached 10 kilometers and then do a hard turn to 45 degrees. Just because the first 10 kilometers of the atmosphere were like soup. Like it was the school, the super sphere for a reason. Now, one uh, kind of distinction from, well, one of the many distinctions uh, from modern KSP that you might currently be aware of is the fact that we don't have a fuel gauge per se. Like, yes, we have fuel gauges in the form of, well, I guess literal gauges, but there's no numerical value with those fuel gauges there. So you don't actually know how much fuel you have remaining. Delta V is not a thing yet in Kerbal Space Program. I mean, it is in the literal sense that the game is calculating Delta V, but we don't know what our Delta V levels are. And it's impossible to see how much fuel we have remaining. So, a bit of a challenge. One thing that made this a bit easier, though, is that electricity is not something we need to be worried about. There is no electricity system in the game yet. But, you know, that's... Uh, I'd rather have fuel gauges, to be honest. <laughs> now, while we hold a 45 degree ascent angle on the nav ball, I'm just keeping an eye on our time to apoapsis. Once that reaches kind of 50 seconds to a minute, we can start flying flat, which, you know, has now happened. And uh, yeah, then just continue keeping an eye on our apoapsis until it gets past the border of the atmosphere, you know, the Kármán line, which is 70 kilometers. I believe for this mission, I aimed for an apoapsis height of 80 kilometers, though that ended up becoming closer to 85 kilometers because this thing does not have very good SAS authority, or I should say the command pod does not have very good SAS authority over the big log stack that you currently see before you. So I kind of had to use thrust vectoring by firing that mainsail engine to maintain a you know, roughly prograde trajectory, uh, which then therefore meant that we ended up raising our apoapsis very slightly. Don't even, I don't know why I even bothered, because I then just detached the lower stage as soon as we uh, you know, crossed the border of space. So... Uh, I guess I, I didn't even need to do that. Don't know why I'm dwelling so much on it. Here we are circularizing. Of course, not making use of a maneuver node because, as I already mentioned earlier in this video, those do not exist in this version of Kerbal Space Program. You might also be aware there is some debris. Uh, the, I, I, I sort of test flew this vehicle to make sure it, you know, gets to orbit. 
That's about as far as I took it though. I was like, well, you know, if this was Kerbal Space Program 1, that upper stage should easily have enough fuel to get to the Mun and back. I, uh, retrospectively rather brazenly didn't actually check the fuel capacity, like how much liquid fuel and oxidizer that fuel tank actually contains when full, to make sure it's the same as modern KSP. Nor did I check things like, you know, the ISP of the engine. I just assumed it was all kind of the same as modern KSP. I mean, spoiler alert, I guess it was because this worked. But yeah, anyway. I've now talked past the bit I needed to talk about, but basically I started our burn towards the Mun. I, well, basically, to get to the Mun without maneuver nodes, you watch the horizon, and when you see the Mun appear from behind Kerbin, that's when you start burning prograde, and that should set you up on a nice trajectory that takes you directly to the Mun uh, without the need to make maneuver nodes. And it does actually get you on a really, really good trajectory as well. So oftentimes when I'm feeling lazy, even when I'm playing modern KSP, I don't bother making a maneuver node. I just get to the Mun in this fashion. And of course, if you were there from the beginning days of Kerbal Space Program 2, this was the best way to get to the Mun because the maneuver node maker was really balked. Like it wouldn't show you what your trajectory past another planet or moon outside of your own sphere of influence would be. So to get an accurate Mun flyby, it was just easier to get to the Mun in this fashion. So yeah, if you're a KSP2 veteran, you probably already knew this. I mean, I guess this is somewhat common knowledge among people who are like play Kerbal Space Program a lot, but you know, just in case you wanted to do this challenge for some reason, then there you go. That That's how you do it. Maybe a better challenge would have been going to Minmus in this version of KSP. Maybe I can do that. Although, I don't know. I feel like as exploring older versions of KSP now sort of run its course, I don't really know where else I can take this. Maybe I can do like a later version than, uh, than KSP 0.16, where they had other planets, like Juna, for example, but uh, maneuver nodes still weren't a thing. So you have to get to Juna without maneuver nodes, or even doing like a, a Jewel mission. Jewel 5 without maneuver nodes. Oh, God, no, no, I'm not doing that, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, is there any more mileage you think to get out of old KSP, or do you think this has sort of run its course? I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. But look at that, the surface of the Mun is rapidly approaching. As you can see, it has received uh, several upgrades to its appearance in the versions since 0.16. Most notably, of course, we've had lots of great graphical mods from people like Lynx with Parallax uh, that have just made it so much more beautiful. But I don't know, there's something kind of, is there, you know, beauty in simplicity? I kind of like like the uh, the way this looks in a, in a weird sort of nostalgic little way. And here we are, there's our shadow coming, <laughs> meeting us, and oh, there we are. I mean, the landing legs in this version of the game were a lot less springy. Um, I think it's kind of cute as well that this is the exact same texture that these landing legs have in modern KSP, you know, to this day. And I believe those ladders have the, uh, that's the same texture model that we have in modern KSP. And we've already mentioned the uh, command pod and parachute are the same as well, but thank goodness that decoupler no longer exists. That was one of the last, I want to call them like legacy pieces. Like there are a few like really janky looking pieces in Kerbal Space Program and around. I want to say 2016, 2017, 2018, uh, Squad did a really good job sort of overhauling them, making them look, making them look a bit more modern. For example, our fuel tank on this lander just looks like an oil barrel. That was fixed. Uh, but that decoupler was real stickler because it was so big and goofy and rubbish looking. And it was the one of the last parts to actually get a modern overhaul. But you know, now and now, now I look back and think, yeah, it looks kind of, kind of nostalgic. I don't know why I get reminded of the old Lego games, or like it's got like a Tonka aesthetic. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's it's got its it's got its charms. Has old KSP, and one of the reasons I wanted to use KSP 0.16 has now sort of ended. But this was the update that introduced EVA, so we can get our kerbals out on the surface of the Mun. Pose for a little picture. No flag planting yet, unfortunately. So they just had to sort of sit there, um, looking, I guess neutral about the whole thing if I was going to summarize their facial expressions and now we can prepare for Moona Ascent which is an, is no different to modern Moona Ascent in Kerbal Space Program you basically just well you know throttle the engine up and point sideways in this case of course we're going for the classic approach of pointing on the 90 degree vector on the nav ball which is the same direction as the Mun's rotation thus gaining us a little bit of extra delta v not that we really need to save the delta v at this point I don't actually know how much we've got left, to be fair, but judging by kind of how much of the fuel gauge is remaining, we have we have enough fuel 
to get back to Kerbin. You know, you, for a MUN mission, you only need about... Actually, I don't even want to say because I don't know what the exact numbers are. But, like, the vast majority of your fuel is getting to the MUN surface. After that, it's kind of, like, very, very low budget to get back to Kerbin. Because, obviously, you know, to get to the MUN, you've got to kind of do it under your own engine power. But to get back to Kerbin, you can do all the deceleration by just re-entering the atmosphere and using atmospheric drag. So that's why kind of the Delta V difference is so stark. Now, this was kind of tedious for me because there is no time warp until you're at 5,000 meters of altitude above the Mun's sea level surface. So that little ascent took a while. I sped the footage up massively for you guys. So time whizzed by, but yeah, that was kind of like a really, you know, it's weird. When I, when I start doing these commentaries, I think in my head about the things that I spent a significant amount of time on. And that ascent, that was a huge chunk of my life that's just, it's whizzed by for you guys. So make of that what you will. Now, I decided not to bother with circularizing around the Mun and just go straight back home. Well, I guess, I guess in the technical sense we are circularizing around the Mun, but then I'm not going to stop burning and then wait for another point in our orbit to do our escape burn. We can just do it all live. There we are. So I'm watching our Kerbin periapsis, waiting for it to kind of, you know, get within the atmospheric boundaries, which there we are. That's done. And then it's just a matter of time warping to that point. I think actually I wanted to re-enter during the day. So yeah, yeah. now we've exited the months of influence. I suddenly on a whim decided to do another retrograde burn. Just a really, really... Oh, I guess we're not outside the months of influence. I thought we'd just time warp. Never mind. Uh, I decided on a whim to do a retrograde burn outside of the... There we are, outside of the months of influence to uh, lower our periapsis. Well, get rid of our periapsis, actually. We're just going on a... We're going for a Kerbin collision course at this stage. Uh, just that we re-enter during the day for nice kind of visuals for the sake of the video, you might be alarmed that, oh my goodness, are you not going to burn up because there's no heat shield on that vehicle? But aha, uh -huh, there was uh, no re-entry, no re-entry in the early versions of Kerbal Space Room. Something that I think the KSP2 devs were really inspired by because it took you know, so long for the sequel to get re-entry. Uh, there's, no there's not even re-entry effects actually, are there here? But uh, yeah, there was, uh, there's no need to worry about heating, G-force limits, anything like that. So yeah, our poor Kerbals, um, so yeah, our, our poor space frogs probably resemble mushy peas at this point, but nah, nah, I can't say that. Look how, look how happy they are. I mean, I really like how Bob and Bill were like screaming for most of this mission while Jebediah, you know, Jebediah. Uh, but here they are all happy that their mission is coming to a nice, safe end. As we look at the giant lens flare effect in the sky that uh, will eventually become the sun in a later update. I guess later updates also uh, de-trampolined the uh, surface of Kerbin as well, because we did quite a mighty bounce just there on touchdown. But there we are, safely touched down. So nothing more for me to say other than, of course, a massive thank you to the names on the right of your screens. They're, of course, my amazing Patreon and YouTube member donators that make all of this content possible. And, of course, big thank you to our sponsor this week, Novium. They make the hover pen. It's actually super cool. I love mine. I'm obsessed with it. It's great. It's like everyone talks about it when they visit my house. That's That was a weird sentence. Um, but, yeah, follow me on X or Blue Sky. There's, I'm Matt Loud on both, so 